This is the Weekly You Demon. I encourage you to listen. All right, welcome to 2019. This is the first episode. We're going to be talking about structuralism. And I tie it back to some Buddhist doctrines the best I can. I'm still experimenting in this area, still developing my thoughts. The podcast today will be my first foray into this area. We're also going to be talking about Nestorian Christians based on a, a text about the Mongol Empire I read last week, which I thought was pretty interesting and had brought back some memories to me of some stuff I'd read about many, many years ago. We also have a pretty good lightning segment coming up and some other things I think you'll enjoy. As always, thanks for listening. Well, Pope Francis was in the news again this last week for telling Catholics who go to church every day but go on hating their fellow man that they should not go to church at all, you know, but rather live as atheists. Well, you know, I, I get it. That's that's an appropriate concern. I mean, if you know, quite frankly, I, I live with that all the time. You know, I don't want people to know I'm religious because I, I fall so short of the mark. I'm often scared, you know, <laughs> to, to let people know I'm religious at all because, like I said, I, I turn to be a jerk and then I give a bad witness or look like a hypocrite or whatever. But, you know, a, a couple of problems with Francis's comment. And by the way, I did not read the entire sermon, so maybe I'm not being fair to him. But one, if people are just going to have to wait till the perfect before they go to Mass, or wait till the perfect before they go out and give witness to the faith, well, very, very few people are going to be able to go out. So, you know, where do you cross, you know, when, when, are you, when are you good enough to go to Mass becomes a question. And I think that's a real dangerous question <laughs> you should be asking. Secondly, Francis himself has been kind of hateful. You know, he's said some pretty unkind thing about traditionally minded Catholics, and about his political opponents. I hate to say he's been hateful. I'm not sure it's really accurate, but he's been pretty sharp in his criticism. And so there are some onlookers who are thinking, he's not saying people who are hateful shouldn't go to Mass. He might be saying people who disagree with his politics should not go to Mass. I'm not saying that's what he's saying, but given how sharp he's been on his criticism towards his political opponents, it's reasonable to think that that's kind of what he's getting at. Hey, you disagree with my position on homosexuals and uh, these other type of you know free sex things that I want to try to I don't want to say promote, but that I, I have a soft spot for. You know, I, I have a particular uh, a point of mercy for. If you disagree with me on this type of stuff, then just don't go to mass anymore because you're giving a bad witness. Again, I don't think that's what he's saying, but uh, people could be forgiven for thinking that. And then finally, the third thing that's wrong with that position is, okay, so these people are going to Mass every day, and they still go out, and they're sons of bitches to the people they see on the street. That's not a good thing. But maybe these people who are going to Mass every day would be serial killers without the sacraments. It reminds me of Evelyn Waugh, the great British writer who wrote um, an excellent book called Brides Had Revisited. He was kind of a dick to everyone he met. I shouldn't, I don't know everyone, but he was, he was kind of a dick to people. Someone asked him, how can you go into mass all the time and, and then be so miserable towards people? And he said, well, you, you don't understand. Without the sacraments, I'd scarcely be human. So <laughs> he said, you think I'm bad now? Hey, if I didn't have the sacraments, I'd be really, really, really bad. And so those are things I'm just not sure Pope Francis' comments take into account. first real podcast segment regarding postmodernism. I'm still new enough to this area that I'm actually typing up my notes and outlines, something I've never done for a podcast segment. At this point, I've gone through about 10 hours of lectures. I've started a couple of books. I've had some limited correspondence with people who know more, more about this than I do. And here's kind of what I'm coming up with at this point. Structuralism appears to be the first naked break with Western intellectual tradition. You had the four horsemen of the apocalypse, that's what I call them, Freud, Darwin, Marx, and Nietzsche, threw everything into disarray around the turn of the century. The structuralists came up with a new way of looking at the world that didn't rely on a central idea. And that's crucial. No central idea. Uh, the entire Western intellectual tradition, from Plato to 
until like 1900, always lied on central idea, whether that central idea was Christ, you know, the logos, the subjective self, the ego, sexual desire, like in Marquis de Sardé, something always revolved around a central idea. Structuralism got away from that concept. Structuralism starts with semiology, which is the science of signs. Its central tenet is that each word means nothing in itself. It merely points to an underlying thing. Okay, and you, you got to think about that, and I'm going to come back to it at the end of this segment. Basically, when you say cow, not really say anything in and of itself. The only reason cow has a meaning is because it distinguishes itself from cat and ball and toilet. And that's the basic insight of the science of semiology as advanced by uh, C.S. Pierce in the 19th century and about the same time, a little bit later, Ferdinand de Saussure. Saussure. But then de Saussure took it further and said, all aspects of society are governed by the societal structure of these signs. You know, these words. The signs form an intricate network of relationships. Okay, that after all, that's all words really do. They work with other words to form meaning. And this intricate network of relationships creates the intellectual air we breathe. And this is crucial. He is saying that we can't think outside of this structure. The structure dictates how we think. So thoughts don't come from inside of us. The structure around us dictates how we think. You know, we are, in a sense, formed by the structure. The structuralist says we have no thoughts of our own that aren't dictated by the structure we're born into. A little bit later, Jacques Derrida and others attacked the structuralist and said, okay, you're mostly correct, but the criticism applies to you as well. Your structural system is merely a product of your structure, so it has no more truth to it than any thinker or philosophy or religion that has a central idea. There is no truth at all. From here, Derrida and others taught total freedom, especially the perverse sexual kind. <laughs> the fun stuff. Now, I, I, I don't know enough about Derrida. I don't think he's necessarily pushing for perverse sexual libertinism. Uh, but sex is the strongest passion we have, so it was the most thing to break loose violently when Derrida started preaching this and started catching on, which it did in the 1960s. Today, we have a situation in which one's sexual preference or desires are the only thing revered. We preach a universal tolerance of everything that does not have a central idea. And we're going we're gonna to come back to that probably in the next couple of podcast lectures. Basically, a universal tolerance for everything that does not have a essential idea. You know, many pundits, especially on the conservative side of these culture wars, have struggled with the, the concept of tolerance and said you're in, you're tolerant social justice warriors of everything except intolerance. It would kind of snicker. But that's not really nap criticism. That'd be like scoffing at Christianity for preaching love, but then saying, yeah, but you won't, you don't love hate. Ha ha ha. So it's not really fair to go back to the, you know, the, the leftists in our culture and say, you're tolerant of everything except for intolerance and think you somehow wounded me, really haven't. But this would be an apt criticism. You, leftists, don't tolerate anything that has a central idea. It's not intolerance you don't tolerate. That would be logical and commonsensical. It's anything with a central idea that you don't tolerate. Because that's what the four horsemen of the apocalypse rattled, and that the structuralists and deconstructionists overthrew. Okay, so now you're, you're wrapped in this Marx, Freud, structuralism, deconstructionism, and you just really, really revolt against the idea of anything with a central idea. So 3,000 years of Judeo-Christian spiritual and intellectual tradition that strove to posit an essential idea, whether it was Christ, the Holy Spirit acted for the Catholic Church, Israel's covenant, the dozens of substitutes that thinkers have come up with since the Reformation, like reliance on scripture, science, inner enlightenment, the idealism of Kant, the ego. If there's a central idea, the left rejects it. They recoil against it. And I think that's where you start seeing the real culture divide coming in. You got the left wedged this idea of deconstructionism and the absolute libertinism and freedom it gives. And then you have the right, people like me, still wed to the idea of a central idea. And we intuitively drop battle camps on opposite sides, depending what our instinct tells us a certain issue says about that concept, central idea or no central idea. You know, that's kind of where I am right now. We'll, I'll keep flushing out as time goes forward.
you know, the whole structuralism, semiology, and the deconstructionism, it fascinates me because its, its starting point appears to be nothing more than the Buddhist doctrine of emptiness. And I know I've talked about that before, but the Buddha starts with the idea that there is, there is no other. It's pantheistic monism. All is one. It was explained to me years ago by a college professor like this. If there was nothing in the world but this, you know, whatever this is, that's all there is in the world, you wouldn't give it a name. That's the central idea of, of, of Buddhist emptiness. The only reason we give things a name, call something God, call this dude Frank, call that chair a chair, is to distinguish it from other things, and therefore each individual thing has no existence in and of itself. It only has existence to extend its distinguishment from something else. I have not seen this in anything I've listened to or read so far, but this central insight of the semiologists from 100 years ago, or more than 100 years ago, seems to be something the Buddhists came upon 2,300 years ago or, or, or further. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where the doctrine of emptiness was developed, but gee whiz, it goes back to the roots of Buddhism. So semiologists seem really, really far behind. What I find particularly fascinating is if you have this pantheistic monism that all things are one, you start coming up with the idea that, you know, words have no meaning. You know, good and bad, love and hate, just and unjust, they have, they have no meaning, just like it has no meaning to call something a chair. It's not really, it's not any different than the table. They're all one. Love and hate are all one. And that makes sense, you know, when it comes like morality, love and hate, you know, being kind to being unkind. Because morality always presumes an other. You know, if, if there was no other, there's no morality. You, you don't love someone who's not there. You can't be charitable towards someone if there is no someone. You can't steal from someone if there isn't a someone. You can't violate God's commandments if there is no God. If all is one, all these distinctions go aside. And what I find fascinating is, in Buddhism, in the school called Tantric Buddhism, which is kind of like Harvey Weinstein on cocaine and Viagra, you had extreme sexual libertinism erupt. And a very basic college textbook on Buddhism says that it's the Buddhist doctrine of emptiness that allows the Tantric Buddhists to engage in their perverse sex practices. I just find it fascinating that all this stuff in Buddhism predated by centuries, anything that the deconstructionists came up with. But yet, the logical extension is the extent, is the extreme sexual deviancy we saw in Tantric Buddhism, or that we saw come out of the 1960s subculture. Lightning Segments I'm not sure what happened this year. I normally get a ton of books for Christmas, but this year I only got one. But it's a good one, and it's a new new release. It's called Hungover, The Morning After and One Man's Quest for the Cure by a guy named Shaughnessy Bishop Stahl. I know I don't patronize people with more than one last name, but oh well, this I read a good review of it, and I, so I asked for it for Christmas, and I'm greatly enjoying it. This guy is a uh, freaking hilarious writer. In the first couple pages, I laughed out loud twice. In the preface, he's describing the hangover. He's going through the various symptoms, you know, the nausea, the spinning, the headache, etc., etc. Then he goes in this passage. But of course, that is all just physical. The worst is yet to come. Attempting to go fetal, you roll onto something. It feels like a fish, but it is your soul. He also touches on something that I didn't realize was a common phenomenon until a couple of years ago. You have that immense feeling of guilt when you drink too much. And not even like drink so much like to the point of mortal sin. I mean, I often feel guilty the next morning even though I just got, you know, kind of drunk or whatever. I remember Frank Rich at Modern Drunkard Magazine talked about that. Uh, I can't forget what book it was. Oh, it was a... It was a uh, it was the article on the lost weekend and how to have yourself a lost weekend. As I've mentioned on previous podcasts, Frank Rich isn't really much into moderation when it comes to drinking, <laughs> but but he mentions the fact that hey, you gotta you gotta get over that sense of guilt and jump back on the horse and start drinking again. 
this book hung over he, he talks about uh, this bishop stall talks about you know the feeling of guilt and he, he cites the famous drink writer kingsley amos whose book everyday drinking by the way should be re required reading for anyone who likes the literature of drinking uh, the the guardian recently ranked in the top 10 of drinking books of all time i have it on my kindle and i've i dip into it frequently anyway he quotes kingsley amos saying Quote, start telling yourself that what you have is a hangover. You are not sickening for anything. You have not suffered a minor brain lesion. You are not all that bad at your job. Your family and friends are not leagued in a conspiracy of barely maintained silence about what a shit you are. You have not come at last to see life as it really is. Unquote. <laughs> it's those of us who've had a hangover just think, you know, everything in life is just falling apart. That's, those are poignant words. Wow. Pop culture just seems to drift further and further away from my uh, my sense of taste, I guess. Friday night we got pizza with my daughter Tess, who's 13 years old, and decided to watch something on TV, and it's often hard to find something that you know is clean enough for her to watch and won't totally bore me. And I said, well, hey, I said, Hulu has The Masked Singer on, and Fox Fox Sports, you know, during the football games, promoted the crap out of this show, so it must be pretty good. It's awful. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this, this show is absolutely awful. It's unbelievable to think that the panel has any clue who these singers are, any clue whatsoever. You have ten thousand plus celebrities to choose from. They're out making guesses. I don't care enough about pop music to listen to a bunch of cartoon characters sing. It's just absolutely terrible. That being said, my two youngest children seem to seem to like it okay, and and. Heaven knows when it comes to pop culture, I don't exactly have the best radar, so I wouldn't be surprised if the thing is a massive hit, but I don't get it. When I was in Detroit last weekend, I went by some condos on Woodward Avenue. My son later told me the sales price of those condos in 2012 were 82500 They now retail for 383000 that's a remarkable uptick. I remember thinking I should buy up some real estate in Detroit back when they were literally letting some houses go for a buck a piece, but I didn't. Well, for a lot of reasons. One, I don't have any guts. Um, <laughs> but two, you know, all the environmental contamination. By the time you get done with the phase one, you sink two thousand bucks into it, and then you find out you need a baseline environmental assessment that can cost you ten thousand. It just figure way too much, way too much effort, and what really amounted to nothing but a gamble. But it does look like those who took the gamble is paying off. This week's website recommendation. The Facebook page for the Weekly Demon. I am now adding fresh content every day. Over the past 25 years, I've accumulated, I'm guessing, 10,000 quotes and choice passages from writers more gifted than me. And I'm going to start putting a quarter passage up every day of the week for this point forward. Try to attract more people to the site, give them, give them a reason to come over, give them a reason to come like it or to follow it. So check it out if you get a chance. Interesting tweet last week. Quote, when Mongols sacked Baghdad in 1258 and killed almost all its residents, only lives of the cities and historian Christians were spared. Their asses stay inside their church. Pretty interesting. I had forgotten this, uh, but there was a large historian Christian contingent in the Mongol ranks due to the conversion of a guy named Wayne Khan. And he, and he was the head of the important and respected curate Mongols who early on joined Genghis Khan. You know, the, the Mongols were a confederation of different tribes, and the and the um, the Kray Mongols were particularly respected, especially by Genghis Khan. So this Wayne Khan, they think, is was the actual uh, reason that he had the Prester John legends. I don't know if all of you know about Prester John, but Prester John was a legend that said started by a guy named by Marco Polo. When Marco Polo went to the Far East and came back. He talked about Prester John, and the idea of Prester John was that. Some of the apostles went to the Far East. I think they mostly looked at Thomas. And by the way, the apostle Thomas 
Uh, they found his remains in India. That's pretty interesting. You know, many, many years later, I'm, I'm thinking like 1900s or 1800s, something like that. You know, when there were missionaries going out, some Indians said, oh, you know, yeah, come look at this. And they, they showed them what the local Indians said. This was the Apostle Thomas from one of Jesus' apostles that, that was buried here. And they actually showed him the, the gravesite. Anyway, but the idea was that uh, the Apostle Thomas started this huge, this Christian community that had become huge in the far, far east. And that, that legend had kind of circulated. And so then when the Mongols started slaughtering the Muslims in the 13th century, there is a hope in, in Europe saying, ah, <laughs> the Mongols, the, you know, these, these are, this is the ranks of pressure, John coming back. And they think that the, the name Wang, Wang Kung, that became westernized into John. That's where it came from. Wang Kung, um, Presser John, Wang John. A lot of people don't also realize that Wang Kong is also where we get the famous line, everybody Wang Kong tonight. <laughs> anyway, so uh, who were the Nisorian Christians? Well, basically they're Christians who denied Christ's full divinity. They were cast as heretics after the Council of Ephesus in 431, the Third Ecumenical Council. The leader was a guy named Nestorius, the Patriarch of Constantinople. He was an exiled when he wouldn't recant. Well, it's kind of interesting, especially since we just had the Feast of Mary, Mother of God. But what really got Nestorius in trouble, got the passions really cooking, is that he, he denied the title Mother of God to Mary. And so a lot of people thought that he was dissing the Blessed Mother. And that caused practical rioting in the streets by monks, especially, who revered the Blessed Mother. Now, that that wasn't that rare. Back in those days, I mean, pretty much everyone had a theological opinion. Just like today, everyone seems to have a political opinion. Back then, everyone had a theological opinion. I forget who it was, but some Christian writer was saying that y y you can't even buy a loaf of bread without having the baker expound on Christ's two natures. Anyway, but the Nestorians were eventually banished, just in general, from the Roman Empire, and they went to the Sassanid kingdom in, in Persia. And there they kind of thrived for a while. They started schools, they sent out missionaries. Uh, they were apparently the first ones to introduce Greek text to the Muslims, which had its own flowering in um, Muslim thinkers like Avicenna and Averroes. I think they might... <laughs> I mean, I was, look, I was reading Will Durant. He said that they still existed in like the 1930s and 40s. I'm not convinced based on some internet searches whether there are still Nestorian Christians. But according to Will Durant, even you know, in the 1930s, a handful that were left still railed against what they called uh, Mariolatry. You know, the divinization of Mary that they perceived in the title of Mary, Mother of God. That's it for this show. Thanks for listening. If you have not done so yet, please go to iTunes, to the Weekly Demon, and leave a review and give it a rating. I'm told that helps boost the Weekly Demon to the search engines. Also, we have a Facebook page. If you can go like it, that would be great. Go to the Twitter and follow us. If you're still listening to the old uh, TWE feed, that's fine. I'll keep that going for a little bit longer, but eventually that feed will go away. So I'd encourage you to go follow the new feed, The Weekly Demon with Eric Chesky. Also, ch check out our website, udemonpodcast.com. You can find show notes and other information that I think you'll enjoy. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.